Well, we want to welcome you to the church. You've had a taste of how we sing, but that's just part of what we do. Um, for us here at Bethel, we have a message that we believe is the most important message that you could possibly ever hear in your life. It's got nothing to do with making you rich. It's got nothing to do with taking away all of your diseases or making your life uh, all that you ever dreamed it would be in this life. But our message is about how to prepare for the next life. And we believe that this life that we're living now is just temporary. The life that is to come will be the permanent, eternal, everlasting life. However, we need to prepare for that life in this life. And a lot of people think, well, that involves doing lots of good things, right? So if I'm really good in this life, then I get to have a better next life. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, today, we're celebrating three people who have prepared themselves for the next life. And they are looking forward to an eternal, joy-filled, amazing life, even if it doesn't happen this time. In this, in this part of life. And we celebrate that with the act of baptism. But what is baptism all about? Um, a lot of Christian churches, in fact, most Christian churches, practice some sort of baptism. However, when you say the word baptism, it can mean many different things in many different people's ears. Some people do something called sprinkling, where you just take a little bit of water and sprinkle it onto people. In fact, as I was preparing to come out this morning, I, I was asking my wife, where's my water bottle? And she's like, we don't practice that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, some people practice, and this is what we practice, something called immersion. And that just means that you, you see there's a lot more than sprinkling going to be going on uh, here this morning. People get all the way wet, all the way under. Some people practice something called triple immersion. Because if you don't go down once, that's not enough, so take you down two more times, just in case. Some people baptize babies. Some people baptize adults. When we were in Scotland, um, uh, we planted a church up there in Aberdeen. We practiced a, a full immersion in rivers. And the rivers were the runoff from the mountains. And it seemed like everybody wanted to get baptized in the spring. And I'm telling you, it is cold, cold, cold. I praise the Lord, we live in the South now. Some people require, some churches require you to be baptized in order to join their church. Some people refuse to baptize somebody if they've already been baptized. So there's lots and lots of things that go on in various churches. And when, when you heard that there was going to be a baptism at the church, you may have had something different in mind than what you're actually going to see this morning. Well, so I want to explain to you why we do what we do and the way we do it. Most of the churches that practice baptism practice the type of baptism that they do based on what they believe baptism does. So, for instance, if, it, if baptism was a requirement in order to get to heaven, in other words, you can't get in unless you've been baptized, then you would want to baptize as many people as possible as early as possible because you never know what's going to happen. A child might catch a terrible illness and, and die, and you would want to make sure that they had already been baptized if you believed that it was necessary to be baptized in order to get to heaven. So that's why some churches baptize babies as early as possible. Some churches, it's just a tradition doesn't really have any significance, doesn't have any meaning at all. And so then it doesn't really matter to them how they baptize. They might have several different ways that they do it. Here at Bethel, we have a very high regard for the scriptures, for the word of God. So therefore, we practice the type of baptism that we do that we believe is both taught and demonstrated in the Bible. I was supposed to have been doing this, wasn't I? There we go. So that's baptism in the church, baptism in the Bible. What does it actually mean? The word, the word baptism or baptizo is actually not an English word. It's, it's a Greek word that they took the letters of Greek and just put them straight into English. And it literally means in the original language, in, it Greek, in the Greek, it means to make whelmed 
or to make fully wet. So if you're the type of person that enjoys a shower as opposed to a bath, that would, you wouldn't use the Greek word baptizo to describe what you're doing. But if you're the person, a type of person that likes to have a bath where you get all the way in and you're completely wet, that's the word that is used in Greek to describe what you're doing. So rather than a sprinkling, it's a full overwhelming is what the Greek actually means. In the Bible, there's a, there's a method of baptism. Every instance in the Bible where a baptism is described, it shows somebody entering and exiting the water. Let me give you just two instances. The first one is when Jesus was baptized. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, it says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Later on in the book of Acts, after Jesus has left the earth and has told uh, the church to go and baptize people, one of the first times we see that actually described is in Acts chapter 8, verse 38. And this is a man who was being baptized, and he commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Every time in the Bible where the baptism is actually described, the act is described, the person goes into the water and they come out from the water. So we looked at the meaning. We looked at the method. Let me tell you what the merits of baptism are. First of all, you need to know what baptism does not do. Baptism does not give you something to present to God as a merit. It doesn't give you, uh, later on, these, these three uh, people that are going to be baptized will receive a certificate that says they were baptized on a specific date at a specific time in a specific way. They're not going to take that to heaven and show it to God and say, look, this is why I should get to come in. This is my ticket for entry. Baptism doesn't do that. Baptism doesn't give you something to give to God so that he has to now give you eternal life. Baptism doesn't provide a sense of spirituality. It, you can't say to somebody who hasn't been baptized, I'm better on the scale of Christians than you are because I went through these waters of baptism. It doesn't do that. Baptism certainly does not provide to you eternal life. I've experienced some services, you may have as well, where, where words were said to the effect after the water was uh, put onto the person, you are now a part of the body of Christ. And that's not true. Water does not bring you into the family of Christ, the body of Christ. It does not give to you eternal life. Those things are spiritual, the body of Christ, eternal life. Water is physical. The physical cannot give you the spiritual. And baptism does not provide you with assurance of your Christianity. There are millions and millions of people over the years that have been baptized that later on decided, ah, it's all a load of rubbish. I don't believe it. So it doesn't provide you with that salvation, with that assurance. Baptism plays no part in the salvation of my soul. It does, however, have a close link to my salvation, just like good works and communion. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is you may have eternal life and never be baptized. You may be baptized and never have eternal life. The two are not connected in that way. But they are linked to one another in the sense that if you have truly been born again, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are indeed a Christian, then you will have a desire to be obedient to Jesus who told us to be baptized. 
And you will have a desire to be identified with Jesus. You want to be like him. And he was also baptized. So what is it? Number one, it is a step of obedience. It's a step of obedience for these three who are following the Lord. And they believe that, God, uh, that Jesus has, has told them, as my children, you should be baptized. And they are taking that step of obedience today. But it's also a step of obedience for us here at the church. Because the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples before he left the earth, he said, go therefore, and he's talking to the disciples, he's talking to them that would be the church, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He told them to do three things. He told them to make disciples. He told them to baptize those disciples. And he told them to teach those disciples. So that's our job here at this church. That's our main job. We do lots and lots and lots of other things. But if we're not doing those three things, we're being disobedient as a church to Jesus. Our job is to make disciples. That means telling people about Jesus. It means telling them about how they can have eternal life. And then it involves baptizing those that do believe. That's our job to do that. So I want to thank you three, DeAndre and Madison and Evie. I want to thank you guys for allowing us to be obedient to Jesus today. But it's not just a step of obedience. It's a picture of my relationship to Jesus, my identity. In Romans chapter 6, this is a long passage. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can he who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. If we have trusted Jesus for the salvation of our souls, for the forgiveness of our sin, we don't put any of that trust into good things that we might do, into being baptized, into giving money, into being a good person, but only in what Jesus did for us on the cross. If that's where our trust for eternal life comes from, then that means we are dead to sin and alive to Jesus. And that's one of the pictures of baptism. It's th as though we were going down into the grave as we go into the water, and as we come out to the water, it's as though we are coming up into new life. It's not actually doing that, but it's a picture of that. It's also a picture of our sins being washed away. It doesn't actually wash your sins away, but it's a picture of it. So something has happened to these three people already. They are already on their way to heaven. They've already accepted Jesus as their Savior. And you're going to hear their stories in just a minute, how that happened. That's already happened. Eternal life is already theirs. They are already in Christ. And what happens here is just a picture of that. They want you to see what has happened in their hearts. They want you to see that their sins have been washed away. 
as though they had taken a bath. They want you to see that they are dead to sin and alive to Christ, that they were dead and one day will die, but they will live again. That's what they believe. That's what we believe. That's what we teach. And that's what this is a picture of. One more passage in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. We're not doing that today. Don't stress. <laughs> by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. We are buried with him to our sin, and we are raised with him to eternal life. Mm. That's the message we have for you. It is the most important message you will ever hear in your life, but it's more than just a message. It's something that you must accept by faith, believe and grasp and completely devote yourself to. And that's what it means to teach disciples. It's not, our baptiz it's not at our baptism. It's not at this moment when these guys come out that that will happen. But it's at the moment we believe and we accept the Lord as our Savior. Baptism is an outward symbol of my repentant heart, of my commitment to Jesus Christ, and of my confidence in a future resurrection to eternal life. All of those things are wrapped up in what this is a picture of. And, uh, and I just want to say a few more words to you. We talked, about, uh, we talked about baptism and the Bible. We talked about baptism and the church. We talked about what baptism is, what baptism isn't. What I would like to do now is I would like to talk to you about baptism and you. So taking it from a, a theological circle, taking it from a cultural circle, and making it a, a personal thing. I want you to personally think about baptism. Is that something that I should be involved in? Well, it really comes down to what you heard these three people tell you about what had happened in their heart. And if something like that has happened in your heart, well, let me be more specific. If that exact thing has happened in your heart, that you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you haven't been baptized since that time, then I would say, yes, baptism is for you. You might be here and, and you've experienced some sort of a ceremony, whether it be as a child or even as an adult, but then you were born again after that. I would say that you need to be baptized because the instances, the picture that we see in the Bible, every single time is a person came to faith and then they were baptized. It's never the other way around. When I was a young boy, about 10 or 11, I was baptized because I thought I was a Christian. It turns out that actually I had only said some words, but I didn't actually believe them in my heart. And when I was 14, I actually believed with all my heart that Jesus was my Lord and Savior. And I confessed to him my sin and I accepted him as my Lord. And I was baptized a second time because the first time was not a picture of what had happened in my heart the second time was. So what does that actually mean to be a Christian? We use terms like that in church, like being born again or being saved. They're all the same thing. They all mean the same thing and they are a picture or they are a, a description of our relationship to God. It's really as simple as one, two, three or ABC. The A is accept that you are a sinner. You don't need a savior until you know you're a sinner. And the first step on the road to accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior is to realize that what he did for us, he did for me personally. And he did for you personally. It's often been said that as Jesus hung on the cross, as the sins of the world were laid on him so that he could atone for them, it wasn't just a general thing that happened. It was actually my sin. The lies that I have told. The things that I have done. 
the cruel words that I have said, the bitter feelings that I have had towards people. All of those things that I personally have done and that you personally have done were laid on him. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If we're ever going to become saved, we need to realize our condition. And there's that, that is that every one of us is a sinner. From the youngest to the oldest. I met a man one time in Scotland who was well into his, into his 80s. And as I talked to him about this very thing, he said to me, I don't think I've ever committed a sin. And I said, well, you've committed at least once because you just told me a lie. <laughs> and as we talked more and realized that sin is not just murdering somebody, it's not just committing a heinous thing. Sin is not just because I did something worse than somebody else. Sin is anything I do that is not what God wants me to do. It's that simple. And then you start thinking about all of the things you've done in life that you know God didn't want you to do. That's sin. And we start at a very young age. The first step, the A in the ABCs, is you need to accept that you personally are a sinner. The B is simple. A, accept that you're a sinner. B, believe with your heart that Jesus died for your sins. In John chapter 11, it says, Jesus said to her, this woman, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And then in Acts chapter 6, it says, Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This man came out and he said, I need to be saved. What does it take? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. A perfect picture right there from the scripture of everything we've been talking about and everything we've been doing. It's that simple. Accept that you are a sinner and believe that Jesus died for your sins. You don't believe that you will ever be a good enough person because you won't. You don't believe that you'll ever have anything to present to God that will be sufficient for him to say, well, never mind about my son. You obviously are better. It's never going to happen. We have to believe with all of our heart that it was Jesus who made our way to heaven. And inherit, that's how we inherit eternal life. Accept that you're a sinner. Believe with all your heart. And then finally see, confess with your mouth. In Romans chapter 10, it says, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So what does it mean to confess with your mouth? with your mouth it means that you genuinely believe and you're prepared to not let it just stay in your heart it's not enough just to be convinced of some facts just to just to in your head know that Jesus died for your sin you allow that to seep into your heart and then it eventually works its way out the bible talks that talks about it like confessing with your mouth in other words i'm not afraid to tell people I'm not afraid to live the life of a Christian. I'm not afraid to be identified with Jesus. That's the ABCs of salvation. It's that simple. My challenge to you this morning as we sing these last few songs is think about this. Does that describe you? Or is this all brand new and quite confusing? If that's the case, talk to someone here at church. We would love to talk to you more about this. This is our whole reason for existence, is to share this with you and help you to understand it.
to help you take your next step in faith, which may possibly be your first step in receiving Jesus. We're going to sing some songs. These songs are all about our Lord. These are all about our relationship to him. So I encourage you to pay attention to the words. Think about the things you've said. And please don't leave this, this building today without being confident of your relationship in Jesus.